everybody's aware that um, this past Monday, <clears throat> we heard of the uh, death of Charles Stanley and um, someone who pastored First Baptist Church Atlanta until two years ago, he retired at age 88. Don't worry, I'm not planning to repeat that here, uh, so, so y'all don't have to worry about that. Um, he um, had a unique um, bird's eye view at his ministry. I began my experience at Georgia Tech in the summer of 1970, and he was the associate pastor at First Baptist Church Atlanta in the summer of 1970. And uh, First Baptist Church Atlanta at that time was on uh, Peachtree, about four blocks away from the Georgia Tech campus. So that was the easiest uh, church for us to get to, and we had heard about it. Roy McLean was actually the pastor at First Baptist Church Atlanta at the time, and he was someone who grew up and pastored in the area of Orangeburg, South Carolina. So somebody from South Carolina knew uh, who he was, so I ended up going down to um, First Baptist Church Atlanta because after my first couple weeks at Georgia Tech, I knew I didn't know calculus, so I knew I had to pray. And uh, I found out prayer is good for some things, but it really didn't solve the calculus problem, you know. But anyhow, it solved the gym problem. Um, and so I was there while he was associate pastor. And, and you know, I was a bird eye view at some of the things that took place. And there was some controversy when he became the pastor at First Baptist Church Atlanta. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, and I saw both sides of all of that. But I will tell you that God used Charles Stanley. Um, there's not only in pastoring that church, which became a huge church when there was not many huge churches. Uh, we we kind of take for granted churches that are running 3,000 or 4,000 in attendance these days. When First Baptist Church Atlanta grew to the size that it was, there weren't many churches that were that large at that time. And he sort of pioneered a ministry that was a large ministry that reached multiple people like that. And God really used him in that way. But maybe the greatest influence that he had was in the beginning of the In Touch ministry that is, touches about 160 countries. Um, his material and sermons are translated into 40 or 50 languages. It goes out and continues to go out every week. Um, it, it's an amazing um, distribution when you think about it. And church responded, you know, North Point Community Church, which a campus meets here, is a derivative of his ministry, which also had some controversy when it started uh, at that time that later got healed and patched up. Uh, so it's, a, it's amazing when you think about uh, a person's life, uh, the years that he gave and, and the influence that it has. And, of course, being right here in Atlanta uh, makes us kin, makes us related. Uh, being Baptistic in his views and part of family was in the association that we're a part of for the majority of the years that he pastored. Uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's really a statement of what the gospel can do. It's a, it's, a, it's a statement of what God can do. One church sitting on the street in Atlanta, a man takes the pulpit and begins to preach. And by the way, the summer of 1970, he preached a sermon around 4th of July, and they copied it. And I don't remember 1970 what kind of copiers they had. Do you, does anybody remember? Did they actually have copy machines in 1970? Yeah, because I remember they, they made out, they, they put the sermon together. Back in those days, they typed out the sermon, I guess, from a tape and put it on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper and stapled it together. It looked more like a mimograph than it did a copy, if I remember right. Well, I got a copy, took it home to my dad, and uh, 
gave it to, I guess that was maybe the first publication of In Touch Ministry, you know, was a, was a mimeographed copy of a sermon that I took on to my dad. I guess if I'd have kept it, I'd have some sort of collector's piece. I don't know. But, um, but I think it's monumental that, you know, his ministry and understanding that God used him in the way that God used him. And I don't think that something like that ought to be just ignored in the passing this week. And I think we ought to remember that church and uh, celebrate that life. And I, I just think we ought to mention it, talk about it, okay? I think it's that important. One of the um, treats that I've had in my life was to have the opportunity <clears throat> to have um, Dan Cathy, the CEO of Chick-fil-A for a number of years, took over from his dad. He's now passed the, the baton on to his son. Uh, but while I was still in Texas, uh, there was an occasion I had to spend about three hours with Dan Cathy, uh, a couple of those hours in my yellow car. And uh, we, as we drove around the Austin area where I lived and just talked, it's probably one of the greatest seminars and leadership that I've ever had, just, just talking. Uh, just talking about a lot of things. He asked me a lot of questions about the church that I pastored. Uh, we went by and looked at, we just built a new sanctuary there, and he wanted to see it. And we talked about what we were doing, how we were doing it. And then he started talking about Chick-fil-A and how his father handed off to him, how that transition looked like, how they had set up a succession plan and all that. And he said, you know, when my dad started, they just started across from um, the Ford uh, assembly plant in Hateville. And they would come up with a new dish and they just put it out there to see what it was going to go, uh, you know, see if it was going to go and see if people liked it. And then they'd come up with a price and see if that price worked. And if they started to lose a little money, they added a nickel. You know, and they started talking about that. He said, you know, we don't do that anymore. He said, you know, I, I got smart people all around me. Uh, they know if we need to have a different dish. Uh, they need to know how much spice needs to go on something. They need to know if we need to increase something a penny or not. He said, I don't get into that. I got smart people that do that. He said, Jim, you know what my role is in this church? I mean, in this company. You know what my role is in this company? And I said, no, sir, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I don't. What, what I would imagine you just you know, run everything. He says, well, I make sure everything's going. But he said, my primary role at Chick-fil-A is I am the keeper of the company culture. He says, Chick-fil-A is Chick-fil-A because of the culture, not because of the chicken. And I am, I am in the role of the keeper of the company culture. He says, culture is extremely important. It is what separates us from other food distributors in restaurants. That has stuck with me for the last, I guess it was 20, 21, 22 years ago that that conversation took place. The keeper of the company culture and the importance of culture in any company, in any organization, and in the church. In fact, Samuel Chan, who was the president of Beulah Heights University that is over in the Grant Park area of town, uh, said this, it was quoted in Church Executive Magazine, the strongest force in any organization is not the vision of the organization, or even the strategy of the organization. It is the culture which holds all the other components together. He said this, when it comes to a church, what is the church's culture? He says, culture is the strongest force in any organization. The best way to understand culture is the statement, this is how we do things here. He also writes, it is the atmosphere in which the church functions. It is the prevalent 
attitude. It is the collage of spoken and unspoken messages that a church has. He also quoted someone else that says, culture eats strategy. What he's saying is, is that a lot of people can come up with strategy, but it's the culture that carries the strategy because few churches have the kind of culture that makes the strategy work. The Apostle Paul knew that. The Apostle Paul spent his whole life starting churches. He started churches all over that area where he walked. And then he didn't leave them by themselves. He continued to write letters to them. Some of the letters we have in our New Testament. Many other letters we don't have, but he continued to write to churches. And the letters that we do have that we continue to read for the last, we've read for the last 2,000 years, we see in those letters ways that he would, after he created culture in a church, that he would hope to continue that culture. Because any of the letters that he wrote, the first part of the letter and the last part of the letter was about culture. Because what he would say to that church at the beginning and at the end of the letter was about what he was doing to continue the culture or correct the culture when he saw the culture going in the wrong way. So as we look at Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 17 this morning, we will see some of the statements of culture that he is making to the church at Rome. First, I thank my God through Christ Jesus for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. In order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. What Paul understood was that he couldn't necessarily make somebody else do something to change the culture, but he could continually have the input that he was in control of to continue the culture. And so as we look at this, there are some things that we can pull out, that we can observe, that if we were to place into our church, it would give our church the kind of culture that would be a compelling culture for Bridgepoint. You know, I want to be in a church that has a contagious culture, has a compelling culture, a culture that people just can't wait to be a part of, uh, a culture that people are looking for, a culture that attracts people, a culture that says they are just so different than other places that I see. I want to be a part of that. And so there's about five or six things we're going to look at today of ways we can approach the life of our church that can continue a culture that can make us compelling. First of all, we need to be thankful. We need to be a group of people that are thankful. Verses eight, or verse eight, 
First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. I thank my God. God was at the source of the life that was lived by the church. Through Jesus Christ, the timeless presence of God was what he was thinking. For all of you, even the difficult, believe me, the, 20th, the 21st century church is not the only period of time that there were difficult people in the church. Even in the church at Rome, there were some difficult people. There were some servants of some of the Praetorian Guard that I'm sure had bad weeks. And you do understand, that's how the gospel had gotten to Rome. Paul hadn't been there yet. Paul was now only on his way to Rome, and he was on his way to Rome in chains as a prisoner. The way the gospel had gotten to Rome was because all the soldiers had been in war, and they had brought back people who were believers as captives. They had brought back people to serve them in their homes, and they were believers. And the gospel had traveled in that way. And I'm sure some of those people had bad days. And they took it to church. You know, I've had to realize in my ministry of 48 years that some of the people that are the most upset with me when they come into the office, and yes, there are people that get upset with me and come into the office, are usually upset about something else and they're just taking it out on me. There's usually something else that has triggered the emotion. And usually when we talk about it, we figure out what it is. And you just learned that. You just learned that. All of you, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith, the application of your beliefs is being reported all over the world. Have you heard about the Christians in the court of Caesar? Have you heard about the lieutenant in Caesar's army who became a believer because so-and-so was a guard in his household? Have you heard? The brilliant Scottish writer Thomas Carlyle lived in a farm in Dumfrieshire, which he called the loneliest nook in Britain. Each day he climbed a ladder to his attic where he worked until dark. His devoted wife, Jane, was left alone. One evening at dinner, Jane asked why he had never expressed appreciation for the food she lovingly prepared for him. What do guys usually do when your wife says something like that? Defense, right? Defense. You're going to defend yourself. Well, didn't you know I usually... Well, what does Carlyle say, the brilliant writer of essays, Carlyle? He says, woman... Must you be paid for everything you do? He was in his defensive mode. With that, he stamped off to his attic workshop. Years later, when his wife died, Carlisle found her diary, a tear-stained book. Page after page, he read this recurring refrain. Oh, I wish you would say a kind word or give me a compliment now and then about the things I try to do to make you happy. You know, some people just dying for someone to say thank you. How many times have you asked God and asked God and asked God and asked God and asked God for something and it actually happens and you never go back and say thank you? How many times has somebody done something for you and in your mind you have it that, well, they should have because I deserve it, and you never say thank you? Do you understand that when we grow up in the South, we're told to say two words? Please and thank you. It's beat into us, isn't it? If you're a Southern boy, you know you're supposed to say please and thank you. I don't know how it is in North, Jill. I'll let you tell me later, okay? But in the South, you got to say, please and thank you. 
There's a re no, not bless your heart. That's Mississippi. That's real south, okay? And there's a reason for that. Thank you can change the whole conversation. Thank you can change a whole relationship. Thank you will not wipe out the complexities of relationships, but it does indicate a transfer of attention from oneself to the value of another person. It is an attitude of thankfulness that can become a transformative trait. If you get into the habit of being thankful, it can be transformational in your life. Be thankful. Be prayerful, verses 9 through 10. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you my prayers. I do it at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. God, whom I serve, one of the ways he served was by prayer, service, can be through prayer. Prayer is a service. Some of you know that I've got three people I contact when people contact me about praying. Certainly our staff and, and myself, we pray. When I contact Jane and her group, they pray. I contact Sarah and her group, they pray. But I also contact Maria because the Dorcas class is a praying bunch of ladies. Dorcas class, raise your hand for me, would you please? There's my praying ladies back there. They are, I mean, I've got people that live outside of Georgia that know about the praying ladies. Not the praying mantises, you know, we, they're known for other things, okay? But the praying ladies, they know who the praying ladies are. But it's the Dorcas class. One of the ways that the Dorcas class serves now, and they used to be able to serve in a lot of different ways, and they still serve in ways that is amazing of what they do. But one of the ways they serve now when they can't serve in some other ways is I know when I contact Maria, they begin to pray. They begin to pray. And just like the other groups that are contacted, we know they pray. And that is a way to serve to do it constantly, persevere in remembering them in prayer. At all times, connected, continuous. And it is God's will, not my will. It's God's will that I come to you, even though it is as a prisoner today. A lady asked her friend, how do you get along with that terrible person? You know, there's really not much way to answer that kind of question. How do you get along with that terrible person? And the answer was, well, it used to be very difficult, but once I started praying for that person privately, God allowed me to see things from his perspective and not react from mine. I now realize she's a person with many hurts in her life. And I love to pray for her. My New Testament professor, Dr. McGorman, said this, praying for one another constitutes a bond that exceeds anything that ordinary friendship can bestow. Though separated by great distances, Christians always have immediate access to a common meeting place at the throne of God. We might not be able to be there when our children are a thousand miles away physically, but through prayer, we can be there immediately. When our friends, when other people we know, we might not be able to be there in skin and bone, but we can be there in the presence of God as if, and maybe even more importantly, through prayer. It's not a secondary presence. It is a primary presence to be in prayer for someone. There are a number of good actions that we can take on behalf of others, but there is nothing more significant and intimate that we can do for someone than to fervently pray for them. What can we do to create a compelling church culture? Be thankful, be prayerful. Third, be expectant. 
show up thinking something's going to happen. How many people come on Sunday morning just planning on getting through with it? In other words, you got your time card, you're checking in when you come in, and you're hoping it gets through in 60 minutes, but you know this church is more like 90 minutes. No, nah, it's more like 75. You know, when's the last time we came on Sunday thinking something might happen? Let me tell you something. I, I've been in a situation before that expectancy ruled the roost. And I didn't know why it happened. God just decided that he was going to do something. And it could happen here too. I had the blessing. And it wasn't anything I did. It wasn't anything I did. But I had the blessing to pastor a church one time that for three and a half years, we didn't have a Sunday that somebody didn't make a decision. For three and a half years. Now, it wasn't always a salvation decision. Sometimes it was a, a decision to become part of our church in some way. But for three and a half years, every single Sunday, that was back in the day when we had an invitation hymn and people walked down the aisle. Every single Sunday for three and a half years, somebody walked down the aisle. Let me tell you something. After a while, people showed up wondering who was going to come down the next Sunday. There's an expectancy. Every Sunday, every church that meets, there should be an expectancy that God, because we know God shows up. We know God's here. We know his Holy Spirit is here. And we know at any point he's ready to go. I have lived my life with expectancy. I guess that's the reason I've done crazy things. Linda asked me sometime in our ministry, are we ever going to go to a church that's bigger than where we are? Because we never have. Every church that God's ever led us to has been smaller than the church we've been to, but it's had more potential than where we've been. Potential has always been more exciting to me than size. Because God's potential is there, and there's an expectancy of seeing potential. I see potential all over this place. I think there's some things we got to do to get us into a little better position, to position ourselves in ways that we can see the potential. But there is potential here. You know what the raw material for a church is? People. You think any people are around here? They're everywhere. And most of them don't go to any church. Be expected. Verse 11, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. I long to see you. There's an anticipation. There's a passion to impart some spiritual gift focused on the needs of others. I want you to have something. I'm one of those crazy people that if a football game starts at 1 o'clock, I'm there at noon. That's, of course, unless I'm with Brian, then he's got to talk to everybody going into the stadium. <laughs> I love to be there to sense the atmosphere, to feel what's getting ready to happen. Coach, you know what I mean, don't you? I just, there's something about what's getting ready to happen. That, that movie, um, what is it? Gladiator, when they started, when they were getting ready to fight, I'm sorry, Deep Mark, the Germans, the, the what do they call them? The, uh, never mind, I'm not going to say what they call them. Anyhow, when the Romans were getting ready to fight the Germans, and there was that quiet kind of expectancy before the battle began. Uh, you know, even in the movie Patton, you remember he would talk about the battles that had gone on on this battlefield before, and he could sense that before the battle. You know, I love the sporting events where you get there, and I sit there, and 
Yeah, yeah, they're out there doing calisthenics and everything, but, but it's just the anticipation of the game getting ready to happen. It's soaking in the atmosphere. It's, it's just the expectancy of everything. I'd love to be there. There's something about that that just wakes me up and gets me ready. Be expectant, he's saying. Long for it. There ought to be a sense of longing that I haven't seen you since last Sunday. I can't wait to see you this Sunday. I can't wait to hear what's happened to you. Uh, you told me about so-and-so last Sunday. What's happened in the last five or six days? When we live lives of expectancy, our relationships move to a deeper level of effectiveness. We live with the anticipation of supportive living so that our perspectives overcome the challenges. Our perspectives change when we are expectant about life. Be thankful, be prayerful, be expectant, be encouraging. Verses 12 and 13. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among other Gentiles. I'm mutually encouraged. Encouraged means to build up, to implant courage into another. Mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Your faith doesn't tear me down. Your faith builds me up. I don't want you to be unaware. Understand, though, I've planned many times, but things have taken me away from my plans. But now I'm on my way. And nothing can take me away because I'm in chains. I'm in, I'm, in I'm in prison, basically. I'm on my way. Stuart Briscoe shared the leadership of a conference with one of his ministry models, Dr. Paul Reese. After, Paul, after Dr. Paul Reese spoke, Briscoe was shocked to see his mentor not go to the green room in the back, but to come out and sit on the front row and start taking notes of what his mentee was saying. He said, the attitude of openness like that allowed me to be better than I ever was. There's a sense to where you can encourage someone by being just simply open to them. Encouragement focuses on the well-being of others. It is our decision to either build up or tear down. The question each one of us has to ask ourselves is that are we a builder or are we, or are we a demolisher? You see, we see both kinds running around in church all the time. We see the ones that live for building people up. And unfortunately, we see people that sometimes they don't even know it. They live for tearing people down. It seems like they tear people down because they feel like that's the only way they can never feel good about themselves. They elevate themselves by pushing someone else down. I don't think most of the times they really mean to do it. It's just been built into them that way. But we have to at some point take an assessment of ourselves and say, are we people who are building others up or are we tearing others down? Be thankful, be prayerful, be expectant, be encouraging. Five, be inclusive, verses 14 and 15. I am obligated both to the Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am obligated, I am debtor. I am obligated to the Greeks and the non-Greeks. I'm cross-cultural. To the wise and the foolish, I'm cross-intellectual. I'm eager, I can't wait to preach the gospel. I just want you to know the gospel. I, it's not about how smart I am or how much I know or who I know. I just want you to know the gospel. And I'll let the gospel take care of the rest. It's not complicated. You didn't come here to figure out 
how much I know you came here to hear the gospel. God never wanted preaching to be about the preacher. He wanted preaching to be about the gospel. It's always been the way he desired it. There are two occasions recorded in the Gospel of Luke where we see into the broken heart of Jesus. And we see in both places, it's the masses that don't know him that break his heart. Luke 13, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those that sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The others immediately following the triumphant entry into Jerusalem the Sunday before the crucifixion in Luke 19, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within the walls. They will not leave you one stone on another because you did not recognize the time God was coming to you. Jesus' heart broke, recorded two times, not over the people he knew, but not over the people that were following him, but the people that did not know him. Our hearts ought to break over the neighborhoods around us that do not know Jesus. And our goal should not be to escape them, but it should be to engage them. Our desire and motivation for sharing Jesus should be the love and hurt we feel when we know people with no clue. Do you feel any responsibility for the person at work who causes you so much grief but doesn't know Jesus? Sharing Jesus was Paul's obligation and our assignment. Ask God to give you a burdened love for those without him. The gospel knows no geographic, racial, economic, or social boundaries. Next week, we're going to talk about some of that. I hope you're here. If you want to know ways that you can get involved in engagement with people that are far away from God, we have ways that you can. Jimmy and Darren have come up with tools that you can use that you can jump in and get involved in praying for people that live right around you that are far away from God. Just see us and we'll get you connected. Finally, be confident, be thankful, be prayerful, be expectant, be encouraging, be inclusive, be confident, be confident. Don't be scared, don't be fearful, don't run away, be confident. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for it is the gospel, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I feel no shame. I'm proud of the good news. Yeah, some people might say it's too simple. It's simplicity is powerful. Its simplicity is complex at the point of it changes everything about you. But its simplicity is what makes it so important, so real, so genuine. It is the power of God. It is the dunamis of God. It is the explosiveness of God. It is the dynamic nature of the divine is what it is. For the salvation of everyone who believes, the delivery of whosoever will, credits, it trusts, 
It's any gender, any race, any age, any background, any status, any sin. Salvation of everyone. In it, a righteousness is revealed, an equality, an innocence, a justness is revealed. It's disclosed, it's revealed. It's not a requirement for us to become like God in our power. It's God acting, making us like Him in His power. We can't do it. Only God can do it in us. It is by faith, it's implemented by our trust. Because the righteous, because the righteous will live by faith. You know, we get saved by faith and we think we've got to live by something else. The righteous will live by faith. Now, that's a quote from Habakkuk 2.4 when God answered his question about evil men flourishing. And he said, the righteous will live by faith. Martin Luther was a young monk, and he was very confused. He earned God's favor by punishing his body, working harder than anyone else, yet he found no peace. He began to study the Scripture in 1515 A.D. One year later, he was blown away by a passage found in Romans 1, 17. The righteous shall live by faith. When he really took that in, when he really chewed it up, when he really swallowed it, he saw all these, all these indulgences he was doing, all these things he was doing, trying to earn God's forgiveness, trying to earn God's favor, trying to work himself up to God was all futile. And he realized that he had to live simply by faith. Not long after that, he wrote the words of a hymn that sung in churches all over the world. It was a hymn that came out of the Reformation, a hymn called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The words are this, did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right men on our side, the men of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath is his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. You see, when we genuinely and transparently realize how the gospel can change a person's life, we will never, never be fearful of telling them about Jesus. Michael sent me a, a text this week, new job he has. Frying up, you're frying up something or making gyros or something, right, Michael? And he's, he's, he works for a, a Muslim family, and he was telling his Muslim uh, boss about Jesus this week, weren't you, Michael? Yeah. You just tell people because you know what Jesus can do. Know what Jesus can do. Al Grounds was happy to preach a week-long revival at Calvary Baptist Church at Fair Oaks. And when people responded, he gladly stretched out the meeting to two weeks and then to three weeks. Calvary's pastor resigned, so Calvary's deacons approached Al to become their next pastor. After all, people responded positively to him during the revival, so they thought he'd become a, a great pastor. At first, Al resisted, but the deacons persuaded him until he finally said yes. And when he came, the church grew like wildfire. People packed the building from as far away as 70 miles. It was unbelievable for a small country church. Everybody was happy, right? Uh -uh. <laughs> Not exactly. Some of the locals didn't like the growth and started holding back their tithes. They launched a whispering campaign against their pastor. Finally, it came to a head when one of the ringleaders of the resistance stood up in a business meeting and said, this church is full of people we, that don't belong here. They don't live here. They don't know us. They don't belong. Now it's time for them to go. 
She continued, I make a motion that Al Grounds be removed from the position of pastor and that all names of those living outside the city limits of Fair Oaks be removed from the church rolls. Church culture just hadn't quite reached her, had it, you know. The church didn't dismiss Pastor Grounds that day, but the conflict didn't go away either. A lawsuit, a suicide, and a couple years later, the church was shredded by strife and the witness was destroyed, and the culture was non-existent. All that remained was broken lives left in the wake of pettiness and conflict. You see, instead of a spirit-led, compelling culture being nurtured, a selfish, combative, controlling culture had taken over, and the church, along with many lives, were destroyed. You see how important it is for each of us to input the right kind of culture into our church so that our church has the culture. The only way the culture is continued, the only way the culture is expanded, the only way the culture is extended the way it should be is for us to be the people that we ought to be in the church and we impart what we should be into the church to create and extend the compelling culture. We need to be thankful. We need to be prayerful. We need to be expectant. We need to be encouraging. We need to be inclusive. And we need to be confident. And if we as a church can be that way, each one of us, and stay away from the negativity and the criticism and the selfishness and the self-centeredness our church can be something special. And the culture will make a difference. Would you pray with me, please?